So, I think that what David Dubine has to share with us is going to be absolutely seminal to everything that's unfolding. A friend of mine says, David, I understand what you're saying, but I, my son's in fifth grade, and I just can't explain it to him because I'm always talking, do you have something that you can create that I can show to a fifth grader? And I said, well, yeah, I'll work on it here. So it's like a diamond, actually, where there's different sides of it. It's not just one flat thing where it gets cold and then... It's not like that at all. We have these variants in weather in the extremes. It's not always going to be cold. We're going to get some normal years in between the uh, cold and, let's say, upsetting years. But the crop harvest, the sun, they call it going to sleep, so I try to put a sleeping sun here. We get the cosmic ray increases. We're going to get a little more volcanism. Massive floods. I mean, massive floods. And also they call it... Uh, you know, rivers from the sky, it's an atmospheric compression event, I'll come into that. And then we get the cosmic rays, and then our jet streams are going to shift and have begun shifting. Well, this is all was planned for global warming, right? They hijacked a natural cycle. They knew it was coming, they knew these would be the effects, and they had to explain it to you because they knew everybody in the real world would see it with their own eyes, and then you would start to ask questions. They had a ready-made answer for you, global warming. Well. These effects are mainly based on solar activity, and here's what's going to happen with us moving forward. The media is going to distract you like no other. They want you to forget what's happening with your food prices and the weather changes, and it's going to be Hollywood-esque every single event. It's going to have to get more audacious, if you will. Now, the police state, the more surveillance is to surveil you in social media, to see your behavioral patterns, because based on that, they can know if you'll be a threat, you'll be a help. You're being... Your social media profile is giving them the information how you're going to behave if there's shortages. And they're using these details about you to see if you're a threat or a help during this time. Heavier police presence, that never would have been ushered in except for 9-11. And it's really quirky that it started then and that we need it now. And it took 20 years to build it up, and whoa, it's ready right now at this very time. A little strange. Media is in overdrive. Now, please notice this. Every single story is about stability right now, and it's almost spooky. Every single story out there that you're reading in the media is about everything's stable. It'll continue to be stable. It'll be great next year. Everything's fine. Just, you know, go back to work. It's all good. And then we get the silencing through the social media, where they're ghosting people off of different feeds. Now, this is one of the most important charts here, and Valentina Zarkova and her team with, uh, you've got Shepard, Zarkov, and Zarkova. They're here in the UK. They put out this chart here, and I want to explain it to you because it's based on magnetism, and these are magnetic fields of the sun, so we have the polarity of positive and negative, if you will. Now, these waves are like sound waves in Bose headset. Sometimes if you put the opposite wave in, it'll cancel each other out when it gets in there. It's a noise-canceling headset. Well, we can get magnetic wave-canceling effects as well, and that's exactly what I'm showing you here. But this is the forecast moving out, so the wider the wave is, the more of a canceling effect it has in terms of solar activity. So when it gets really wide like this, the solar activity is declining and absolutely going back into something we haven't seen in centuries. This only occurs once every 400 years. Now the intensity of it is to be debated on how intense it's going to be. Is it a heavier, more powerful cycle overlapping and overriding on this 400-year cycle? Meaning, is it a combination of 400-year cycles as we go through, and then something heavier is coming. But as we divide, I put the lines in here and divide it out with the red dots. So there's a two to three year lag period because it, solar activity happens today. It's not going to affect, there's a little bit of lag period behind. So as we go into 2021 here, this is where we really get into the intensity of the solar changes because, again, it's a couple of years lag time. So think about all the changes we were seeing in 2016 are manifesting right now or 2017. They're just not sure if it's a two or three year lag. It's still under debate. But anyway, we're a couple years behind on the solar activity in terms of the real effects happening on the Earth. So this scares me a little bit, actually. If we're down here and these are the effects that are happening now on our planet, what's going to happen when we get in here? And that's coming next year, 2021, 22. This is what's happened. This is where our solar activity is taking us. And we already see the crop losses mounting across the planet. If we're getting huge crop losses in this little area, what's going to happen here? This is, where this is why I believe governments are trying to mitigate panic and not really tell everybody. 
Now, you and me, it's kind of difficult to understand a quadrupole for magnetic poles on a celestial object. Four, not two. We have a north and a south. This one has four, our sun. So we've got north, north, south, south, if you will. And they're in layers as well. We've got two layers. That's why I call it a double dynamo in the sun, because we've got two layers with four magnetic poles. People have been trying to do the math and try to disprove them. Nobody's done it yet. If they have, you'll hear about it in the news, but nobody after two years has been able to undo their math to prove that these cycles are interlooping as such. Now, this comes off the same report, off Sarkova's report here. Again, this was done 2015, and then they updated it in 2018. The modern grand minimum, 2020 to 2055, ouch. We're going to go a very long time without being able to grow a lot of food. Now, the entry into this event here is, this is our solar cycle we're in right now, and as we get down into the next solar cycle, and then shoot, we just drop off a cliff. So this drop off the cliff right here is approximately 2024 going down into 2030 or so. And at this bottom point here, the person who put this report out is calling on governments around the world to stockpile food right now for the lean years of 2028 through 2032. The person who wrote this report is telling and begging governments to get ready for this by stockpiling food right now for these changes that are coming. And they're forecastable. It's not like we're... We've seen this before. It's, it's, it's forecastable. So you start to look for the signs. What do we see a sign? There must be something telling us the planet's cooling somewhere. We've got to start with the upper atmosphere first. And here we are. They call it the chill of the solar minimum. The thermosphere. This is a layer in the upper atmosphere edging on space. And here's where we are. And we've actually dropped now and broken that record of, of what they've had here. So... The thermosphere has actually cooled beyond into the actual record-breaking points already, so that has been confirmed, and it was expected anyway. Now, this is going to continue to, to go down in, and they don't know where the depth or where it will stop. They really don't. We're in uncharted territory for our own modern society of instruments. We don't know where it's going to stop. We've seen it before. We know that it's going to have an effect in the next layer of the atmosphere, in the next layer, and next layer down, and then here on the ground surface. When we talk about the sun connected to the earth, and I showed you those images of all the interconnected magnetic field lines, etc., I'm just going to make it real super simple and say positive charge and negative charge, like your battery, plus minus. Now, over the last 400 years, I should say, well, there was a little dip in the Dalton minimum. So, you know, 400, solidly 200 plus years, the earth and the sun have had a chance to equalize their electrical inflows to each other magnetically, electrically. They've had a chance to equalize for over 200 years plus because the Dalton minimum wasn't so strong, so I'll even go out on a limb and say for the last 400 years we've been equalizing charge. Well, the sun is quickly stepping down. If it's going to step down in its state and we're still highly charged, where is that electrical field going to go to? It needs to discharge somehow. Yeah, it's going to discharge. I don't know how, well, I mean, I'll try to give you. It's called the global electric circuit. And this is what governments are piggybacking on right here. They know the atmosphere is going to become highly charged on a natural cycle. So what they're going to try to do is ride in on you know, geoengineering and the delivery of, and I'm going to say, Deborah, the device you showed yesterday of beaming electricity from space 25 years ago was undoable, not because of the tech, because of the atmosphere not being highly enough charged to deliver that. It would be like, let's say this is a, a copper cable, and then I would cut and cut. The electrical flow would normally go through an entire cable, but if you cut out a section, the current wouldn't go through it. Now, if I put a highly charged plasma field or some kind of electrical uh, ion on, or I guess the ion chamber right in there, that current could jump through the air, literally. And this is what they're piggybacking on. They're expecting amplified effects from a natural cycle using all of what we're seeing right now with the uh, particulate metals in the sky. Now, bringing back to the effects that we should see, and again, we should be seeing things if it's truly in play. So here we go. Things that were considered incredibly rare, like never ever seen so much that when you would see it or capture it on a film once, it would make front page news because it was that rare. Here we got a, a blue auroral jets, common now. This is an electrical uh, discharge up into one of the magnetic field lines coming down from the sun. So our electrical field is actually trying to charge back up and connect to the sun. Red sprites, once unheard of. Even things of myth and legend 
And here we are, now they're common. Almost every electrical storm across the planet is showing these red sprites now. And then we have these, where does lightning usually discharge to? Yeah, it goes from the ground down. Well, now we're getting upward lightning coming off the earth. Well, this is again, it's an equalizing charge. That overcharge is trying to jump out and do something. It's trying to reconnect with the field lines. So we're starting to see this thing, and I, I highly encourage you to look this up. It's called the Global Electric Circuit, and it explains how the ionosphere is being highly charged on a natural cycle. And inside, before we hit to the Earth's crust, this whole area of the atmosphere is more highly charged, ionized. So we get incredible weather storms and so many electrical effects of, of things that are driven by the motion of this electromagnetism. And especially when they're trying to charge it even higher with geoengineering and then run their experiments and 5G and everything, they're trying to use this natural, more highly charged atmosphere to make everything happen. Now once this dissipates after solar cycle 27, they're going to have a very difficult time continuing the programs that they're doing now because the atmosphere itself will come back into a state of equilibrium and it just won't have the charge it does today or marching forward more highly charged. So their window of opportunity to do everything you're talking about from 5G to geoengineering, everything is squeezed into just literally 25 years or less. They have a window of natural opportunity to amplify what they're trying to accomplish. Yeah, if, this, if, if we had a highly charged sun like we did in the 1990s, everything they're doing now would be just moot. They couldn't do it because the, it takes the atmospheric charge to continue what they want to do. It's just not going to work. It is now, though. Is anybody familiar in science? When you discover something, you get to name it, right? Yeah, part of the game. All right, so this is a plasma filament rope. And it was only seen for the first time in 2017, and they named it Steve. These guys were out drinking, and they noticed it, and they named, one of the guys' name was Steve. I forget his last name. But they named it Steve. Hey, have you seen Steve? Look, there's Steve. Now, this had never been sighted before in the night sky. First time ever. Plasma streamer coming down, which means that the atmosphere is becoming electrified enough that a plasma is now more highly charged that it's becoming visible before it wasn't. I mean, that field line was still there, but you just couldn't see it. It didn't have enough charge to turn it to glow mode or turn it on where you could see it. So they saw it the first time, 2017, but then last year they seen it three times. Now, if you, one thing you do notice is the streamer here, fine, it's really compact and it's in a very tight line. We come here and we get this, they call it picket fence that's behind this aurora. They call it picket fence aurora with a field line current there. And then this one is really surprising because you can actually see the twisting ropes of current in between each other there coming down. Yeah, it's incredibly amplified. You gotta realize that from this to this is one year. That's how much change is occurring right now, how quickly this is happening. So, I wanna jump you back in ancient history. You know, the petroglyphs, a lot of them have been proven that they saw plasma discharges across the atmosphere and that's where they, there's a certain period of time around say 18, 18,000, 19,000 years ago when they came out of or were coming out of the first iteration of the glaciation before the Younger Dryas cooled again. Uh, there were some huge atmospheric discharges where they saw this and then you know a lot of our petroglyphs that we see are based on real world events that they saw in the atmosphere that make no sense to us today. But the plasma discharge that they saw, like lightning bolts from heaven, literally, is what this is all about. Now, I put this here. This is that ionized rope that you saw earlier right here. So we're beginning to get the base construct of what they're seeing for Squatter Man already in our atmosphere. This is a little like, you know, something's changed, definitely. I'm very sure governments know, because I know somebody who advises our president back in the United States. So I know for sure that at least the American government knows what's happening because I know one of the advisors who's advising them on what's happening. Every government on the planet knows this. I'm saying every single one, but would they tell you? Maybe not. Why not? Now, solar wind, this is another thing. Like a, a very active sun is going to be having tons, of part I mean, tons, billions of tons of particles rolling out off the sun and solar wind. So also, if there were effects from the sun, the solar wind should slow down. Slow down, not stop. It literally stopped. And I said, well, when was this? Oh, that was January 12th of this year. 
the solar wind actually stopped enough to where a magnetic field ballooned out because there was nothing compressing it. There was nothing pushing on it to lock our magnetic field in, or otherwise known as the magnetosphere. We weren't expecting solar wind stoppage till like 2027 or 25, somewhere in there, but it's occurring now, which is years ahead of where it should be occurring. And again, another look at the solar wind. This is plasma density, like really how much of those particles are packed into a cubic centimeter blasting toward the Earth. Solar wind, you can see the magnetosphere is very compressed. Like if you blow on a balloon hard enough, you can see, you can see your breath compressing around something. Or maybe, uh, you know, like a flower, or not a flower, but one of those weeds before it turns into the white and blows away. If you blow on it and they're still intact, you can make it bend around something. That's your, consider that your own solar wind on the flower. And then we come here, no solar wind. So you can see when it's compressed and we have solar wind on our magnetosphere, we get that nice tight compression, it locks our jet streams in place. When there's no solar wind, it just completely expands out. And this is happening now, not in the forecast. It shouldn't, this shouldn't be happening for you know, another five to six years, at least on our forecast that we were originally doing, but it's happening now. Governments are gonna take advantage of this. Cosmic rays, and I'll come back into the cosmic rays here. Now, there's an in inverse on this, and the reason I bring up cosmic rays is they're, they're charged particles. They're helping, that's what's electrifying part of our atmosphere and creating more cloud cover. So here, it's an inverse. When we have high solar activity, oh, here we go. When we have the high solar activity, we come down, it's low amount of cosmic rays penetrating our atmosphere. When we come into low solar activity, we get a high amount of cosmic rays, but there's a delay of uh, usually around nine months because I put the arrows there so you could see it. So the peak's not exactly at the bottom of the solar cycle. It's offset a little bit to the right, about nine months or so. So again, these lags in effect, they're not instantaneous when something happens on the sun. It, there's a little lag behind. Now, we're coming into this cosmic ray density here. That's the highest ever recorded, even back into the 1800s when they were using cloud chambers and figuring out x-rays back in the day. They know what's happened in at least the last 120 years with x-rays. And again, what they can do is they can reconstruct what happened with the cosmic rays by using uh, beryllium-10 when they measured in the soils or ice cores mainly. So even though we weren't alive and we didn't have the instruments at that time, it left a signature. And there's different ways we can look at these different signatures with these different isotopes. Beryllium-10 measures how many cosmic rays there were. So if we're heading into the Maunder Minimum, we're looking at something that we should have never seen before because it's going to be really high. And we're here and expected to go at least to the Maunder Minimum level for cosmic rays or higher, depending on how strong the cycle is. We can come back and the sunspot, so remember the group sunspot number, and if we do trace this back in history, low solar activity, what happened in the early 1800s, 1815, so? Yeah, you're without a summer, wars, what? Yeah, how were they able to do that? A weakened public, probably, from... But you start to see when you, when you get these dips in the solar activity, you, know, you start to get wars and different kind of interactions, uh, economic stress and different types of things like this happening. I'm gonna explain as simply as I can. Cosmic rays come blasting in and they have a charge with them. And what they do is that charge obviously attracts something. And what it does, it attracts these little condensation particles that in turn connect to another condensation particle which in turn turn to a cloud droplet, and then they make clouds. So the more cosmic rays we get, the more clouds we're gonna get. But at the same time, the more charge we have in our atmosphere, the more they're gonna be able to use geoengineering to get a higher charge into the atmosphere. They're piggybacking on the natural cycle to get the highest amount of effect that they could never get, ever, if we didn't have this happening right now in, our, in terms of our cycle. Now this comes out from the Global Warming Policy Forum. Uh, now they're finding that there's up to seven times more action inside these cascading galactic cosmic rays than previously thought. Which means that if they thought one cloud formed because of the interaction, now they're like, oh no, seven clouds are gonna form. It's a trickle down, it actually cascades. Like this is one cosmic ray breaking and slamming into other stuff. 
So I want to come up to the cosmic radiation management here. Well, I will in a second. But the cosmic ray monitoring, again, if we're going to start to see higher effects, we should really use science to see are there changes happening. And what, sure enough, shoo, right up there we're going. And it's not going to stop here. We're going to be going into solar minimum and continuing to go to this grand solar minimum for another 20 plus years. And it's just going to keep going up and up and up, way up here, where we've never seen it before. We don't even know the effects, really, except rivers from the sky is an effect that is expected. So I have a lot of people asking me, hey, what are these particles you're talking about? Dude, you're talking about particle. What's a particle? OK, so we all know what atoms are, and there's neutrons and protons. <laughs> And then we also get some uh, gamma rays and x-rays. These are also slamming into our atmosphere. They're all charged. They all have a little tiny charge with them, and they create clouds. High-speed electrons, those are from the sun, blasting in. We get all these, uh, and when they, remember, they try to confuse you using super high complex lexicon. So ions or ionic charge just means higher charge, like more electric charge. So if your phone and you plug it in, it's, it's, it's charging, right? You're getting more electric in there. That's exactly what that means by ionizing the atmosphere. You've got to use simpler verbiage to understand it. Places in the northern hemisphere seem to be experiencing higher cosmic ray concentrations than places further south or, I don't know, California is not increasing at the rate of Maine and Washington. But what I just showed you over here in Norway, up here in, or sorry, Finland, Again, these northern latitudes, but again, this is where we're growing crops up here. So if we're going to get heavier rainfall, bigger blizzards, di different hailstorms, etc., it's going to be right in our crop zones. And this is why, how all this dovetails in. Now, what is the purpose of this geoengineering here? You know, we have so many conjectures, and Deborah gave a great talk last night. Thank you so much for enlightening us on what you see and how you see it. There is a definite purpose to this. Now, I want to take it to a step further. Now, there's different layers of this geoengineering onion, if you will, and they're all riding on the same electrified atmosphere due to a natural cycle. Cosmic radiation management. It is a different way to look at geoengineering. It's a multi-purpose program. These nanometals that they're putting in spraying across also nullify the charge of these cosmic rays that come in. When a cosmic ray collides with one of those nanometals, it loses its charge. It doesn't form clouds. So another conjecture is that they are using a, a, another layer of this geoengineering program is for cosmic radiation management to slow down the effect of cloud building across the planet to reduce the amount of you know, mega floods that occur in every storm. To not create clouds. The whole purpose is to take away the charge of that cosmic ray so it doesn't get a charge. So when these cosmic rays come in, they're charged positively. They have a charge with it. And other things attract to it. And that's how it forms a cloud at the end, because it's a small little particle, and then it gets a little bit more attracting, and ooh, you have two, and now it's a little bit bigger, and then something else jumps onto it, and it's a little bit bigger, and then whoosh, and then you finally get a cloud droplet. And this is how it works. So when the cosmic rays come slamming in and they hit a piece of barium, strontium, aluminum in the atmosphere, boom, their charge is gone. They can attract nothing at that point. They're just an inert, it's just an inert particle. It lost its charge. It hit the metal. So you've got to realize that if you're a government and you understand that this is going to cascade and create massive amounts of clouds and serious floods, a geoengineer, we, we, can, also, we can also use that to mitigate some of this cloud formation for now. So that's kind of another way to look at, you know, what the geoengineering program, a different layer of the onion for a purpose, a government purpose again. This is for military application to stop cloud building in some areas or encourage cloud building in other areas if they want to flood people out. Because they could just stop spraying in a certain place and the clouds naturally would form the cosmic rays and you would get massive floods. And we've seen incredible flooding across the planet. Now here, uh, and again, a natural cycle is happening, but the Harvard Research Program, and yeah, oh, it's a tin hat foil, th yeah, 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 right, sure. Geoengineering program from Harvard is now live, and they're coming out publicly and telling you that the Harvard Geoengineering Program's coming out, it's here, it's called Scopex. Rolls off the tongue, doesn't it? Made for the media, Scopex, sounds fun, easy to talk, everybody can write it, everybody can say it. And it's easy to remember, isn't it? Scope X. But try to say stratospheric controlled perturbation, and that kind of doesn't roll off the tongue so easily. 
Again, they're riding on a natural cycle. What they're going to do is use Scopex. They're going to try to cool the atmosphere with calcium carbonate, or so they say. And then once they do it, they're going to say, look, we're responsible for cooling the climate. You just need to keep paying us. Because termination shock means when they stop doing it, uh, we'll get runaway global warming again. So they're going to take credit for the cooling on a natural cycle, and they're going to try to make you continually pay for infinum because they cooled the planet. What they're trying to do in terms of messing with our atmosphere to cool the planet is criminal. I never consented to anybody cooling my planet and allowing them to spray the skies to do such a thing and taking public credit for it, and it's already live in the spring of 2019. So everybody who said, oh, you're a conspiracy theorist because you talk about geoengineering, well, please refer them to this sun-dimming experiments from Harvard. That's live now. And it's ridiculous that Harvard's coming out. And they want to try to mimic the Pinatubo eruption and cool the planet six-tenths of a degree. Now, what happens if we get a real volcanic eruption and they have all the materials up there and we get a real Pinatubo eruption again? How long will it take for the last particle that they sprayed to fall out of the atmosphere? And what kind of combination of real volcanic ash, sulfur dioxide, combining with what they put up there, we might get something run away that they never planned on. And I don't know if they took that into consideration in their models or not. Now, we're going to get more cosmic rays based on this, too. The, the magnetic poles are wandering. And this is not a scare thing. And please don't be like, oh, it's scary. It's just the magnetic poles are wandering. And it's really interesting that it looks like a continuum. Now, notice this little one. This is where the magnetic pole went back in 200 AD. This, this chart here is from 1500 AD, how the pole moved around all over the place. It started in 200 AD, and then it, obviously it jumped back from where it was here, and it moved around to 1500 AD, and then we can grab it again at 1900. And we can see it's continually moving. It looks like it's going to move in, all, in the exact same area again. So. Things that are moving on magnetic field lines, such as whales or different kind of insect migrations, they're going to be affected by this. Yes, absolutely, electromagnetically. So you've got to realize, we're conduits ourselves. Our bodies are conduits. We're receivers, our antenna, if you will. But as the sun's electrical state changes, we're also going to experience changes too. Have you seen people behaving strangely around you? Yeah, their cognitive abilities are off a bit, right? <laughs> you get the feeling that something's just not right these days? Yeah. <laughs> this is all electrical in nature. Like, our bodies are electrical. We're electromagnetic beings. So I was going to come to that later, but I'll bring it up now. We're electromagnetic beings, so we're going to be affected as well by the sun. And you see routinely through history, at points... Humanity wakes up and throws off the chains of what was really overseeing them, and it's no longer acceptable to be ruled this particular way, or you know, economy can't work that way, and we see it again and again. When we hit these low-activity solar areas, it seems that society changes in ways that we've never seen before in terms of just the way we process the information of what's acceptable and not acceptable on how these, I don't even like to call them the elite, the people, the sociopaths running in the place, it's no longer acceptable, and it seems to incur in mass where there's a mass awakening, and I'm really hoping that does happen here in the very near future. But people forget so quickly, and then suddenly they, they try to get their uh, control mechanisms back in on top.